So let's talk about Swindler A. Stone, Woods, and Cook was the first nationally known integrated drag race team. Born out of necessity, it continued in friendship, and they became one of the most popular and successful drag race teams of the time. Let's check out their story. Big John Masmanian in the red coupe meets one of the Stone, Woods, and Cook cars in an all-West Coast showdown. and Cook win it going away. I think the great thing about being a gearhead is that it transcends gender, economic status, nationality, and race. I mean, anybody can be a gearhead, and you can like any kind of car you want. If you have the money, you can purchase a car of your very own to tinker on, fix up, and customize. Having a love of cars can make friends out of some who wouldn't under any other circumstances. Be friends. Unfortunately, here in the United States, we aren't always united, especially when it comes to race issues. Issues sometimes so deep that even being a gearhead couldn't overcome. This is a story of the unlikely partnership of Fred Stone, Tim Leonard Woods, and Doug Cook, and how they didn't allow skin color and the laws of the era to keep them from forming a friendship, a partnership, and ultimately the first integrated race team. My fellow gearheads, this is a brief history of Stone, Woods and Cook, the first black owned integrated drag racing team. It's the late 50s and the United States is knee deep in the civil rights movement. Black Americans were heavily oppressed by segregation laws of the South, otherwise known as Jim Crow, that in a nutshell, didn't allow black and white people to exist in the same space and provided separate yet subpar accommodations for people of color and denied them of their basic human rights. Conditions of the South were so bad that those blacks who had the means relocated to northern parts of the country or out west to California, where even though Jim Crow still existed there, provided a somewhat better environment that allowed blacks to prosper, build up their own businesses and thrive, but separately. Tim Woods was one of those successful black business owners. In the late 50s, Tim was the owner of Woods Construction, the largest minority-owned construction company in the West, and the second largest in the United States. Right about that time, gassers were starting to get real popular in drag racing. Sharing a love for drag racing, especially gassers, Tim Woods partnered up with Fred Stone, the manager of Tim's construction company, to form a race team. They built a 42 Studebaker powered by a blown Oldsmobile engine to compete in a gas supercharged and named the car Swindler. The famous gas awards were just beginning to get big, so they were in the right place at the right time. Again, California was a much better environment for black Americans in spite of Jim Crow. However, even though Woods and Stone had a car to race, they couldn't drive it at the local track because blacks weren't allowed to drive on the drag strip. In order to get their car on the track, they had to hire a white driver and watch from the stands, wherever that was for blacks to watch. Pittman had his own sea gas car at the time, but primarily drove for Stone and Woods. Unfortunately, the Studebaker was destroyed in a towing accident. Stone and Woods were forced to build a new car, a 41 Willis Coupe. Powered by a blown 488 Oldsmobile, they named the new car Swindler 2, with Pittman still in the driver's seat. The car was painted blue, which turned out to be the color that defined the team. And on the door was Fred Stone's name and Tim Wood's son, Leonard Woods Jr. as the owners, with Pittman as the driver. In 1961, with Pittman driving, they won the A-Gas Supercharged Class at the Winter Nationals. It was about that time when Pittman seized the chance to campaign his own car on a full-time basis. So, Pittman left the team on good terms joined by their crew chief, John Edwards, to build up his own race team. It may have seemed like a huge loss, and it was, but with every great loss comes great opportunity. And that opportunity was with a young local drag racer named Doug Cook. Cook was a phenomenal driver, consistent and fast, on top of being a great mechanic to boot. 
a native of Little Rock, Arkansas. He moved to the West Coast when he was a teen and spent his spare time at the Santa Ana drag strip. Pittman left before the 61 U.S. Nationals, which gave the team time to get Cook up to speed driving the Swindler 2. But tragedy struck again as they blew three engines during qualifying and, like the original Swindler Studebaker, Swindler 2 was also totaled in a towing accident on its way home. The team built a new 41 Willis Gasser and kept the name Swindler 2. Powered by a blown 467 Oldsmobile, the new car was piloted by Doug Cookie Cook, who showed himself to be a consistent and formidable drag racer behind the wheel of Swindler 2. During the 1962 season, they set the A-Gas Supercharged class record with a 10.25 second pass at 140 miles an hour. In addition to competing at NHR events, they also competed in match races for big money against other gasser legends like Big John Masmanian, Ohio George Montgomery, and their former teammate K.S. Pittman. The 1963 season brought a big change in the form of a weight break for the A-gas class, placing Swindler 2 at a disadvantage for the remainder of the season. However, they still managed to remain competitive, bringing home a class win at the Mickey Thompson event prior to the Winter Nationals. If they were to remain competitive, they needed a new car. So, they built a new 41 Willis that was purpose-built for this new weight break for the 64 season. This new car was named Swindler A. It was a thousand pounds lighter and powered by yet another blown 467 Olds. Swindler A was painted black for a brief time and earned the nickname Black Widow, although it was painted back to blue shortly thereafter. Swindler 2 was moved down to B gas supercharged and renamed Swindler B. Being that Doug couldn't drive both cars, he enlisted his brother Ray to pilot Swindler B. They also briefly campaigned a third car, a 33 Willis they called Dark Horse, that was driven by Chuck Fenders. Thanks to the Gasser Wars, Gassers had reached their height of popularity in 1964 and were a big draw for spectators. The Stone, Woods, and Cook team began the 1964 season with the win against Big John Masmanian's Willis at the Winter Nats. Even though Cook won with a blistering 10.03 second quarter mile at 142 miles an hour, he just barely eked out the win over Masmanian's driver, Bones Ballow. That was too close for comfort. It was apparent that their blown Olds engine was at its technological limits, and the Chrysler Hemi engine was really starting to make a name for itself at the drag strip. So, to remain competitive, they upgraded the Swindler cars with blown Chrysler Hemi engines. The gasser wars of the mid-1960s were wild, to say the least. It's like the excitement of AA altered mixed with the hype and trash talking of WWE, with the copious side of late 80s, early 90s pro mod popularity, and you have the Gaster Wars. These cars were arguably predecessors to funny cars of that era, and the match racing crowd was the bread and butter of many drag strips. Fueled by local newspapers and drag racing publications, Gaster teams would literally gaslight other teams by talking trash and slinging mud at each other. Further fueled by sponsorships from performance parts manufacturers, and fans would pack the stands looking to see who would end up on top. There was a plethora of insanely fast and popular cars, but the team of Stone, Woods, and Cook topped them all. Swindler A with Doug Cookie Cook at the helm was a deadly combination for competitors. They were definitely fast. So fast, in fact, that Swindler A was the first gasser to run consistent mid nine second quarter mile times and clocked the best time of 9.57 at 149.25 miles an hour while Swindler B also did the team proud by running a best time of 10.33 at 134.96 miles an hour. The Gasser Wars were an insane time for drag racing and stayed strong until 1967, with the Stone, Woods & Cook team running strong the entire time. After 1967, Gassers began to decline in popularity as sanctioned bodies refocused their efforts on top fuel dragsters and funny cars. Swindler A became a donor car for their next venture, Dark Horse 2. This was an A-gas supercharged 1966 Mustang that unfortunately met his untimely demise in the form of a crash with Doug behind the wheel. Thankfully, Doug survived, but his driving days were over. 
The team continued on with other cars like an Opel GT, a 67 Shelby, and even built a funny car Mustang in the 1970s. The Stone, Woods & Cook team were highly respected among their peers. When these gearheads got together, it was all about racing and not about race, although race was still a big issue at the time. There was an article on NHRA.com that interviewed Dick Gazan, who would crew the team from time to time, and stated that there were times that Tim Woods couldn't stay at the same motel as the rest of the drivers in certain cities. But for the most part, it was the racing that was a common denominator for all of them. The Stone, Woods & Cook team was a unique partnership of blacks and whites during a time that it wasn't acceptable in society. While it was formed out of necessity, it continued in friendship. Basically, a race car owner couldn't drive their own car down the track, and a bunch of other racers stepped in so that they could see their car on the track, and it led to the first racially integrated and one of the most, if not the most popular gasser team ever. I see all of my subscribers, and I see the variety of races, ages, male and female, that gather together in the Gearhead Lounge because you just want to see some cool videos with badass cars. And that's why we seek the common denominator. Gather together, mingle, bond, and have fun together. Your kindness towards me inspires me to do my very best to supply each and every one of my subscribers with quality content that you'll want to come back to over and over. The Stone, Woods, and Cook families continue to remain friends, even after the original three half passed on. They were all pioneers for fighting against racial tyranny, but they weren't even trying to start a movement. They just did it. They were all good people doing good in the face of evil, and their efforts made them famous. Not because they were seeking fame, but because it was just the right thing to do. God bless them all.